I'll start with uh, Trine. Trine was a competitive gymnast from age 8 to 18. She's currently the Director of Development for Wayne County Sexual Assault Forensic Examiners Program in Detroit. She serves on the Michigan State University Sexual Assault Nurse Examiner Advisory Board and was co-curator of the Finding Our, Voice, Finding Our Voice exhibit at the MSC Museum. She's received numerous awards, including um, ESPN's 2018 Arthur Ashe Courage Award and the Humanitarian Award from the Foundation for Global Sports Development. Jessica, as a girl, trained to be a professional dancer, and she's danced with several professional ballet companies. Jessica recently completed her bachelor's degree in elementary education, and she serves on the board of directors of Small Talk Child, Child Advocacy Center in Lansing, Michigan, which guides children through trauma and gives them an opportunity to heal. Jessica is also a recipient of ESPN's 2018 Arthur Ashe Courage Award and the Humanitarian Award from the Foundation for Global Sports Development. David and Stephen, or Stephen and David, there we go. Uh, David Eluk and Stephen Ungeleider are the researchers and producers for At the Heart of Gold. David's an attorney and Stephen is a sports psychologist and they founded the Global Foundation for Sports Development and that aids in creating safe environments for children and teens. They also created the Courage First program, um, which was developed under the guidance of the survivors of Larry, Lass Larry Nasser and it offers training and resources for adults to help prevent abuse in sport. They both have decades of experience in working with sports institutions, including at the Olympic level. Uh, David is on the LA 2028 Olympic Organizing Committee, and Stephen has written several books on Olympics topics. Uh, Trude and Jessica, why don't we start with you? I talked a little bit about what you're doing now. Can you talk about coming out of this experience what you have done and want to do to make sure this doesn't happen again. Do you want to start? Sure. Um, um, I'm Trini Gonzar. Um, I, I think I, I never expected to be working in sexual violence. Um, now that I am, I recognize how many people don't understand sexual violence and sexual assault, that if we don't educate and if we don't talk about this, um, it's going to happen again, and it's going to continue to happen. So these kind of conversations are super difficult, but they're so important to be able to create change. Otherwise, we're just going to brush this under the rug, and it's going to keep happening. So for me, I wanted to focus on education. I wanted to focus on survivors, and I wanted to make sure that institutions um, such as what happened with us don't get allowed to have, have that happen again. So... Yeah, following up on that, um, as a survivor, I wish that I could stand here and say that Larry Nassar is an isolated event, um, but unfortunately that isn't the case. Um, I grew up in the Lansing area, and it's a small community, um, and we all are from communities of our own that, that have predators of their own, and I agree that education is a huge piece. Um, it's a big part of my life in general and working with children, and um, their innocence and their perspective on life is, is one of the main reasons that I love working with them in general, but um, I think that it, it makes me that much more motivated to want to protect them and listen to them and make sure that other people are following suit as well because um, they have voices. If you work with children, they have voices to tell you about learning to use the toaster and all of the things that are exciting in their lives. Um, but they also need people to stand up for them, as, as noted in the documentary, that. Um, it's our job to, to look out, to protect them the way that we weren't protected, to listen the way that we weren't listened to. Um, and it's not just our job as people who are sitting here on panels. Um, it's all of our job as a society to make it an exponential conversation um, so that people can be protected and we can live in a world that's um, a dangerous place for predators and a safe place for people and for children. Well, first of all, uh, I want to acknowledge our sister survivors that are here uh, and all the others um, who we've met with on many occasions um, for your incredible courage and strength uh, to not only come forward but set an example. Um, also for uh, Judge uh, Rose Aquilina, who you all saw, uh, for her 
really restoring my faith in the criminal justice system. She's taken some heat for some of her outspokenness, uh, but I'm, I'm deeply appreciative to her role in our film and uh, empowering uh, all the sisters to, to come forward. Um, yeah, it was, it was not easy to make this film, and uh, there were uh, steps along the way where uh, we had uh, some, some difficulties, and of course the politics uh, behind the scenes. Um, but yeah, we're, we're really all in this together, um, and I've sat with a number of, of, of survivors, and I've sat with... Uh, interviewed a number of FBI folks and criminal justice folks uh, and investigators, and uh, what they have said is the system is is dysfunctional. It's incredibly dysfunctional, and all along the way there were there were, there were places where this could have been stopped, and as you saw, um, the system failed, and and people weren't believed and weren't trusted, and. Um, so it's a, it's a composite of all of us. We have to listen uh, to our children. Um, one of the FBI agents who is now involved with trying to work with the uh, US Olympic Committee was involved with a Penn State case. And he was there for five years, and he actually uh, did the formal report on the paternal situation. And he told me personally, he said, Stephen, it could be an entire generation before we shift the paradigm and we change the culture of, of this predatory behavior. David, can you talk about what your and Stephen's foundations and groups are doing to prevent this from happening again? Uh, yeah, as, as, as a result of the film, we're launching a program called Courage First uh, with uh, many of the uh, gymnasts or dancers, survivors as uh, ambassadors for that program. We're very pleased with their participation. And uh, it's going to be a, a nationwide program that we're rolling out, and it's going to target not only education for youth, but also, very importantly, for, for, for adults. As you saw from the film, educating the adults as to the signs of abuse is, is very important, so that's something we're rolling out. Uh, we're also going to be launching a tour of the film. Uh, starting in the fall, we're going to be taking the film to uh, schools and universities around the country and having educational airings in that regard. Jessica, when we, we talked on the phone last week and we talked about how for really decades now there have been these messages uh, to talk about issues of sexual abuse. I mean, I remember even when I was growing up, there was the good touch, bad touch. I mean, this has been going on for a long time, but still it is so taboo. And you told a story about how you and parents of some of your students, how you talked about what had happened. Um, with children. Can you, can you talk about that experience? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I do believe that a big proponent of creating change is starting conversations. Um, and I felt very um, inspired to have an opportunity to speak to my students, especially my older students, about my personal story. Um, reading things in the newspaper is one thing, but you know, having someone you know go, th go through something like that is also very powerful, um, which was a big motivation for coming forward with my story. Um, and in the dance studio, I, um, I was absent for a week when we were traveling. And of course, my students were wondering why I was gone. And um, I told them that, you know, I, I essentially told them that I was sexually abused and was speaking out about it. And I had a little girl who's about seven years old, and she looked at me and said, what's sexual abuse? And I panicked. And I realized that that feeling of panic um, not the question that she asked, but that feeling that I had is the problem. That feeling of, I can't talk to her about this, maybe I should tell her to talk to her parents. I was, I was baffled at someone who's spoken to so many adults, but how do we talk to children about this? You know, so we went on through class, and um, later I, you know, gained the courage to say, um, hey, you know, come here, I wanted to talk to you about what we were talking about earlier. Um, and I explained to her, I said, um, have you ever had conversations at school or with your family that um, you know, your body is your personal space and people aren't to um, cross those boundaries? And she was like, yeah. And I was like, well, sexual abuse is when someone does something they're not supposed to with your personal space. And I was 
basically trembling. How do I talk to a seven-year-old about this? And she goes, okay, and skips off. And I was like, oh, okay, oh, oh, that's, that's how that's gonna be, you know? And I just, something that was so panicked to me was so, so simple to her, but has, if something comes up in the future, I hope that she'll remember that conversation in such a simple way that it's her body, it's her space. Um, I had another experience with a student who was just another age group above uh, who came up to me and she said, Miss Jessica, my mom told me what happened to you and I'm so sorry, can I give you a hug? And I just, my heart was so happy. You know, I have no idea what entailed the conversation with her mother, but, but something went right. Something went right for that child to feel comfortable talking to me about that and comfortable seeing that that's not okay and I'm here for you as an eight, as a nine-year-old, you know, so I think that the way that we talk to our children and the way that we talk um, as adults to one another, but especially to children, is, is a big piece of the conversation that, that needs to be had. It's interesting from what your story, that what my takeaway from that is that sometimes as adults, we feel like it's so difficult to talk to children, but for the children, it's actually not so difficult. Mm -hmm. it's, it's our problem, really not theirs. Trinae, when we were talking last week, you said that you wanted to make sure that people walked away with the knowledge of the ability to recognize grooming techniques. We can't assume that everyone who is nice to children is a child predator, because obviously they're not. And I thought the, the film made an excellent point of saying, what a nice guy, and, and you made the point in the film as well. So mm -hmm. how, how do you, what are the, what are the, you're a professional at this, how, do, how does one distinguish the nice guy from the guy who's grooming children? You know, that's a, that's actually a really tough question in, in the big scope of things because, you know, you have a coach or you have a trainer or you have a doctor who puts extra into your child. So you think, oh my gosh, my child's so special. Or, you know, this is a privilege of ours that we, we have by this extra attention. And in our case, um, not, not my, mine specifically, but in our case, he was giving um, pins from the Olympics, jackets, um, but in my personal experience, my grooming was I was at his apartment regularly. You know, it, it was becoming very close with my family. When, and I hate to scare people. I talk about this a lot in my profession. But be scared. Think about who is with your child and who is with them alone and who is putting extra attention into them. Because even though it seems maybe that they're just a good friend, that could be the nice guy. That could be the same nice guy. And um, why aren't you wondering why that person is putting that extra attention? Because yes, as special as your child is, your child could also be sexually abused right now. So I think there's a perspective that you have to take in a shift of your mind. Because if you think about it, sexual assault's been happening from the beginning of time. I mean, this is not something that's just begun. This has been something that's been from always. So having this topic talked about and understanding what grooming is, is going to have to change your mindset. It's gonna to have to start taking a step back in your own life and thinking, hmm, why is he or she wanting to spend extra time alone in the classroom or the bus ride? You know, there's just different it's that things. that alone part too that I think. Yeah, you know, the hand on the leg or the extra attention or the rub on the back or, you know, just simple things that maybe you think are normal maybe aren't. Mm -hmm. um, the, one of the reporters in the, in the film, uh, Scott Reed said, this is a quote from him, these monthly camps at the Caroli Ranch in Texas were a huge factor in creating this culture that created Larry Nasser. Well, I think what he was saying was essentially that Larry Nasser did not become who he was in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. And David or Stephen, do you want to? You you are you know this community, the professional sports community, um, or actually, or the Olympic sports community very well. Have changes been made so that if we put Nasser aside for a minute, the culture and community that that allowed him to go? I don't mean the people who didn't report when they should have reported. I'm not looking at them. I'm just saying the culture of those camps that you portrayed so well in your film, the culture that allowed him to flourish. Has that culture been changed? Well, uh, I'm glad you brought up uh, the Corelli Ranch. As you saw, the, the Corellis uh, were considered the preeminent uh, leaders, coaches in uh, Olympic sport, coming from Romania and then moving here and, and creating a different uh, style and methodology. Um, 
so the, the Crowley Ranch is gone. It was actually under contract to the US Olympic Committee, which was hidden for a while because they wanted to, to keep some distance. But uh, that was brought out and, and the Olympic Committee immediately uh, dismissed. Uh, and I also want to do a quick diversion here. Um, Scott Reed uh, with the uh, Orange County Register, Julie McCurr with the New York Times, Rebecca O'Brien with the Wall Street Journal. Um, these are outstanding, and Liz, you, you know these people. They're, they're amazing. They're outstanding uh, investigative reporters and journalists. Um, uh, Juliet and Rebecca have covered the Olympic beat for years. We go back 25 years. And I'm deeply, deeply appreciative of, of the hard work that they did. They, they took some deep, deep dives uh, early on, way before the Nasser trial to expose the system, the Corollis and the Olympic Committee, USA Gymnastics, Steve Penny, and uh, really did some, and the, and the Indy Star, did some extraordinary uh, reporting. And I think as a result of that, um, it empowered a lot of people uh, to, to not only come forward, but people put people on notice, like the Corollis and like USA Gymnastics and the US Olympic Committee, you know, um, people are watching you. But did it? But did it work? Are we going to have another Crowley Ranch in a year or two or three? Where they, where they, where they create this environment where the nice guy gets to win because everyone else is so not nice? I mean, that, I think that was very clear in the film that he, that he was the trusted friend because nobody else was a friend. So are we going to see another? But Bella Crowley was very successful, right? So are we going to see another? ranch and other system like that take its place? Well, I'll give it to Dave in a second, but um, you know, there's a lot of unknowns here. Um, the Olympic Committee, uh, or USA Gymnastics is gone. They've been disbanded, decertified. The board is gone. Uh, Steve Penny has uh, been indicted. Gymnastics goes on. Right? Yeah, yeah. There, there will be, even though USA Gymnastics is gone, thank God, for all of us who love the sport and embrace the sport. And we wanted to really articulate that. We didn't want people walking away going, you gotta get rid of the sport, you gotta be done with it. It's a really bad, it's a beautiful, elegant sport. And all of us who've been there um, know what it, what it feels like. Um, so thank God we still have uh, uh, training camps, we still have coaches, and we have good people uh, who are working with uh, uh, our Olympic athletes. We're, we're, we're 13 months away from Tokyo, so we have uh, young ladies and young men who are preparing for the Olympic trials. So yes, they are being coached. As far as you know, the institution, um, I pray and, and hope that we never see anything like this and that we do completely uh, shift this, this paradigm and, and you know, make sure we only bring in you know, good people. But uh, I think there's a lot of unknowns. Well, it's another thing just to play off of um, what Stephen was saying is until people believe the survivors, we're always going to have this kind of problem. We are going to have the Kavanaugh cases. We are going to have a consistent predator getting away with the behavior that they get away with because people believe the predator and they don't believe the survivor. And yeah, I, I mean, the, the system has to change. People have to change. People's mindsets have to change and start believing that these survivors, I mean, we could have been the exact same scenario. People could have truly said, Larry's a great guy. I said that myself. And I had this treatment 800 and some odd times, and I thought it was medical. It was my word versus his word. There was no evidence, there was no proof. I had no photos, I had no anything. It was his word versus mine. And in most cases, the survivor's telling the truth. There is more chances of the predator actually walking free than the survivor getting justice. So until we start changing our mindset and believing the survivors, the predators are getting away with and I'll just add to that, um, yeah, uh, we're hopeful, obviously, as, as Stephen and Trinidad said, but institutional change is so difficult, and I'll just give you one example in making the film. We have four minutes of Olympic gymnastics footage in the whole 90-minute film, and we had to license that from the U.S. Olympic Committee. And so the licensing arm of the USOC said, okay, you can have it. It's going to cost you $300,000, four minutes of film. So I wrote a letter to the current leadership of the U.S. Olympic Committee and said, please, this is important, we're making a film 
about this important issue. Can you please waive the fee? And they wrote back a very nice letter that was obviously written by a lawyer saying, we appreciate your letter, but no, it's going to cost you $300,000. So that, that's what makes you wonder. Is it, it, it has the mindset really changed. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, so, so given that experience that you had with the, with the fee not being waived, do you think another Caroli-type camp where the children are treated the way that they were treated, which makes it easy for a Larry Nasser to come in and do what he did, do you, do you think that could happen again, or do you think we've learned our lesson and they're gonna, that won't happen again? I think it's hard to say it won't happen. I mean, there's such this, this drive to winning, uh, and, and gymnastics is, like most sports, I mean, you, you've got to push the athletes, otherwise you're not going to be competitive. And, you know, where you cross that line, it's, it's I mean, hopefully films like this will, and, and the efforts of the survivors and, and the Courage First programs will help, but there's no guarantee. I, and I just want to say, excuse me, um, there will be more training camps, um, and um, there there will be, you know, more coaches and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, good, solid coaches. Um, but I think what's important is with the new legislation, you saw Senator Bumathal, who's chairman of the Judiciary Committee. You saw Senator uh, Jerry Moran. There's two other congressional people that have called for hearings to either take over the Olympic Committee uh, and absolutely do away with it, which is a little bit dicey. The U.S. government running the Olympic Committee? I'm not so sure. But... It's the point I think they're making is, you guys really don't have your shit together. And if you are gonna uh, empower predators and you're not gonna protect our children, we as Congress will step in, we'll take your funding away, and we'll, we'll shut you down. And, and I think that's what's happening. So Liz, to your question, yeah, we'll have more training camps, but under Senator Feinstein's new uh, law, uh, parents not only will be allowed, they'll be encouraged to be there, and when a child goes to the bathroom or goes to changing, a parent will be there. And there's no such thing as uh, a coach travels to a meet with no parent or goes across state lines to a competition with, uh, with no chaperone, no parent. That, those days are gone. I can promise you that. Yeah, I th I, I'm just going to say one more thing. I mean, until we hold people accountable for those things, um, they're going to get away with it. This isn't just gymnastics. This isn't just 2020. This isn't just women. Um, this is human. This is a very human problem. And until we start holding people accountable, whether it's in Congress or whether it's in the USOC or USAG, nothing's going to change. I mean, we can talk about it, but until we are holding those people accountable, um, they're going to just keep getting away with murder. So... And to continue on that as well, I think that, you know, if you look at the nature of sports and not just gymnastics, but any sport, I myself am a dancer and know that it's not the, you know, the act of the pressure of sports and the nature of sports, um, but it's the danger that revolves around it in turning a blind eye. It's not the pushing, it's not the, you know, there's so many factors that go into it, but what allows this to happen is the people who turn the blind eye. So when you're saying, you know, for that friendly predator, friendly predators don't, you know, come in starting the end result. They come in and they test the waters. When Larry Nassar was treating Trinae in the apartment, no one said anything. When I went a step further, no one said anything. That's how you create a serial predator. <coughs> and so I think that's a common misconception is that when people have blame on themselves, it's because all of a sudden you realize all those little steps that you didn't realize before. So when it's, you know, someone, if you listen to Kyle Stevens' story, playing hide and seek, you know, if, if those little things are being unwatched, the unwatched moments are, are what are the most dangerous. And as much as we want to start with Congress, as much as that is so important, we have to start with our own lives. And I know that at the end of the day, as an educator, I am successful if I put the well-being of a child first. Above a friendship, a relationship, a family member, it's about a child. And it's about the, the culture around it has to be about protecting them and, and really keeping our eyes open. I think we're ready now for questions from the audience. A uh, woman in a red shirt back there. Oh, well, hold on, I'm sorry. <laughs> what were some of the politics and obstacles that you encountered in making the 
this film. You have a few hours. <laughs> I'll I'll keep it brief and uh, turn it over to David. Uh, you know, being on the inside and being a, a psychologist who's been in sports medicine for, like I said, uh, 39 years, I've worked not only with gymnasts, but the Swing Federation and Taekwondo and uh, fencing. And so uh, I've been immersed in the culture. And uh, Jessica said something interesting. It, it's, it's not just gymnastics. Swimming had a, a horrible problem years ago uh, that made some media, but uh, not as much as it should have. So um, it's pervasive across the 28 federations. There are 28 in the summer and there's seven. Um, so being on the inside, uh, I had the interesting role of talking to my colleagues, David, and, and other lawyers and uh, other people on our team. There are about 17 of us. And I said, you know, you guys, uh, we need to go to the Olympic Committee for two reasons. We need to uh, say to them this we won't tolerate this. This has to stop. And we're, we're part of it. We all need to be in this together. Let's work together. I'm not pointing fingers. I'm not saying you did it, you did it, Mr. President. I'm saying we all have to take responsibility and, and bring ourselves into a room and, and start working on this. And of course, they, they shut me down. And then later on, I, we went back uh, when we started the film and um, I said, hey, we're doing this film. We don't want to be sneaky. Uh, we don't want you to hear about it from HBO or the media, but we're doing a film. And by the way, would, we, would you be part of it? Would you engage with us? Because we're all in this together. We've all been part of sport. We all have children who are in sport. We all know people in sport. Why don't we join together and be part of this, either be interviewed or, or, or talk to us? Once again, I was, I was shut down. So. There are a million backstories and some really fascinating things that we'll be talking about when we go on the road to educators. We talk to law enforcement um, and judicial conferences, uh, but there were there were some serious uh, tension and, and uh, roadblocks along the way. Uh, let's see. Any other right here? Uh. No, thank you for sharing. Um, I kind of want to step back a little bit in that I do care about the children, the children of the world. Um, but do we know that we obviously know the, there's a profile for a predator. We know there's a profile in what causes that. Uh, I don't know what causes that, but we know there's a profile. And so now that we know there's a profile for these people and how they operate in the taste of waters, you know, what I would like to see is organizations, especially that deal with children. Um, and gymnastics has, is, is the kind of sport that you have to have some money. This is the sport. Sorry, can for, you ask a question? Yes. Okay, go ahead. So, you know, can, are there any suggestions or any things that are gonna put forth to be the proactive? Like how do we stop before, you know, how do we stop? What are the systems? Because sport is for middle and upper middle class. Can you imagine what happens? I deal with a lot of poverty and I do a lot of advocacy. Mm -hmm. And whenever you have children that are poor, that problem is so even your larger. Is... Do you have any ideas? Yeah, on... yeah um, there's actually a lot of programs. Um, myself and another one of the survivors, Amina Tomashow, have started Survivor Strong, and our entire focus is education. So, um, working with institutions, law enforcement, um, I mean, anything from prosecuting attorneys down to doctors, healthcare. Um, the people that are on the forefront that somebody might disclose to them or they might be in a scenario that they need to be protective. So there's actually tons of programs. There's mm -hmm. Darkness to Light, there's Courage First, there's Wayne County Safe, organizations that are doing a lot. I think it's super important to look at your community, mm -hmm. see who's in your community, because right now you might not have any idea that there's even a program whatsoever in your community because it's never touched your life. But there is something that's happening in your community and there are national programs that are happening. Just search them out and talk to us. I mean, we have lots of options to help 
And that's why we're here, is we want to give you those options. Yeah, and to continue on that, I, um, I serve on the board of directors for the local child advocacy center, which was not something I was familiar with until I was opened up to this, but a big part of what we talk about is how to reach an underserved population because abuse happens and um, abuse does not discriminate, but the resources that people offered are. And you know, even things like transportation to be able to be offered therapy is something that is a barrier, and how can we break down those barriers? And when you look at some organizations that do incredible things, um, they're often underfunded and they're often underappreciated for the work, the incredible work they do. Um, so to, to be on the inside of that and to be on people who find out how can we provide transportation to get people here, how can we do group parent and teen groups to help with prevention, um, I think that the deeper you look and the deeper you support in your community, um, the better opportunities all populations have in our communities. I'm in the front right here. Hi, first of all, thank you for everything you're doing. I have a question um, about, I, I have three girls in gymnastics. I have nine-year-old twins and an 11-year-old, and they love it, and their gym is like a second home. Um, and I've asked my, um, it, this issue has come up at our gym where mm -hmm. we live. There was a coach there that was questionable. So I did ask my 11-year-old, has anyone ever touched you that's made you, you know, in an uncomfortable way? She said no. Um, I'm trying to figure out how much to talk to her because I don't want to scare her. So I'm riding that line mm -hmm. between wanting to get the information but not wanting to ask her so much that I instill fear um, uh, and make her nervous about being yeah. at the gym. Like, should Absolutely. I don't want her to think, is there something I should be scared of? I think that um, part of Survivor Strong that Trené um, and Amanda Thomashaw has started is meeting the survivor where they are. And I think that opening the dialogue, she will know that um, they can come to you when the time is right or if something does happen. I know that my mother knew and I knew well before we had a conversation about it and it was just a look that we shared that, that told that story. So I think opening the lines and you know, having that, that conversation so she knows that she can go to you is important. Um, and, but it, it is a hard line, especially with parents and especially with fathers. It's something that I have a hard time with, but um, just offering that support is, is the first step. Also, um, just so you know, my mom asked me the exact same question, mm -hmm. and we are three daughters in gymnastics, and I told her no. Yeah. And she was in the film. Um, knowing what I know now, if you could say to them something along the lines of, if you ever want to talk to me, if there's any, anything that's ever happened to you, I'm here for you. I'm a safe space. I'm willing to walk you through it. No judgment. Um, just so you know I'm here. Because my mom asked me the exact same question, and I definitely flat out lied to her face and told her no. Did you lie, or you didn't think you were being abused? Um, I knew that it had happened to me a lot of times. I didn't believe it quite yet, but also I was definitely not ready to tell my mom. Mm -hmm. for any reason. I mean, I so think... part of you knew something was wrong. Yeah. But you were not ready to talk. Yeah, I think it's a really difficult thing to talk to your parent, especially if you think that they think you're in trouble, that you did something to put yourself in that position. Um, and children often think that. They think, gosh, if I wouldn't have gone that way or if I wouldn't have done that or if I wouldn't have been in that situation or if I would have known better. And they don't know better. They're 11 and, and 10. You know, they don't understand. But if... They know that you're there when they're ready to meet you where they're at. They're a lot more apt to talk to you about it than a flat out, did that ever happen to you? Mm -hmm. and, and another significant piece is that a changing story is not an um, incorrect story. I mean, psychologically, when you look at when trauma happens, you place things in boxes and you shove them far, far away, which is how for many years neither of us knew we were abused. So when someone asks you a question, your boxes are packed away. And slowly, you start to pick up on other things that you may not have before. And before you know it, the boxes are opening again. And I know that I had that with my own story. It, it changes in the sense of you have more realizations, not that you're making things up. And that is the biggest piece of feeling like things are your fault or feeling that guilt. Um, and not feeling like people will believe you because stories change as you realize what has happened to you and you realize the extent of trauma. Um, so recognizing stories change, but 
It's and true. Also, kind of to what Jessica said, I'm sorry I could go oh, on no, for this, on, but to your point, because this is probably the most important question, in my opinion, is for the parents, because you don't know and you don't know how to protect and you don't know how to make your, it better for them. Um, but if you could recognize that they're going to come to you when they're ready and not when you're ready, because you want to know and you want to protect and you want to be there for them. Um, let them know that you're safe, that you're, they're not in trouble for what they've been in a situation and that it's okay to come to you when they're ready, just for all parents. Well, let's go to the back, the woman in white. I think abuse is difficult as an adult, but I can imagine as a child it's especially difficult. And I'm just wondering what the long-term impact was on you with uh, your own relationships, your own children, how you sort of, you know, live a normal life having experienced what you did. <laughs> That's a loaded question. <laughs> um, you know, it's not great. I think people see us and think, you know, that we're this army of survivors and that we're so courageous. But um, there were, there is a lot of tears. There's a lot of heartbreak. And, and quite frankly, to be completely honest, I've gone through every single person in my life and wondered if I can and can't trust them. And, I mean, down to every single person. My husband, my father, my, you know, and, and angry. You go through these cycles as a survivor. And... Um, I'm, I'm at anger. I was at really, really sad when I did my impact statement, but I'm, I'm frankly really pissed off now. And that puts a different fire in me, especially as a mother. Um, but I also know that in order for me to tell you or tell somebody else how to get through this, I have to get through it. So I'm going to the counseling. I'm trying really hard to have this conversation and to not just be angry. Because if I sit in that space, that's not healthy. So, I mean, it's not easy. It's not easy to watch that film, to yeah. be honest. I, I don't think for any of us. Yeah. It's, it doesn't get easier. I think um, for me, a personal struggle is looking at my relationships um, and saying, what is a healthy relationship? And looking at any communication I have with someone or relationship is the impact and the intent in that relationship. And I stand up for people always who mistreat me. And I believe as an optimist that people aren't meaning bad things for me. And I will spend a year crying before I'll stand up for myself. And I'm happy through, through therapy and through realizations that I can stand up for myself. Um, it's way easier to stand up for others than it is for yourself. Um, and I think that advocacy is important work because it makes you feel important to stand up for people when not even other people didn't stand up for you, but you didn't stand up for yourself. Um, so I think that healthy relationships are something to really consider with yourself and with your children or with people around you too because um, it's a really core concept that is very um, diminished when you go through abuse of really any kind. Let's see the gentleman right there. Uh, thank you very much for your stories. Really appreciate it. And my question is really about men. Yeah. So how can um, men, both young and old, what can you say to us, going back to wherever we're from, how can we be effective leader, um, allies sorry, in this movement? Um, well, I think that the most important part of what we're trying to do as a whole here is welcome men to this conversation, because I think um, the important thought about this is if women could have fixed this, we would have, but we can't. We need our men, and we need those alliances, and we need the men to hold other men accountable. That is not acceptable behavior. I'm not cool with what you just did. And um, I think that that's a really uncomfortable position for men at this stage because they're not used to having to do that. And you making that change is going to empower other men to make that same change because they're gonna recognize your strength not as a weakness. They're gonna see that that's a strength that you're having for standing up, because everyone has a mom. Everyone has a family friend, a daughter, a sister, someone close to them that you can think, even, it's even a son, that you can think of this happening to. So when you start holding other men accountable, other men are gonna follow suit. 
Mm -hmm. I'll just add to that. Um, there's a scene, as you saw in the film, where the father with the union shirt, a good union man, uh, goes after Larry Nasser. And at one point, some members of our team suggested maybe that shouldn't be in the film because really isn't this really about women and what do men really have a role in the film? And as exactly as you said, women can't solve this problem alone. And I, I find that scene to be one of the more impactful portions of the film, emotional, where you see the, the, the impact that this has had on, on the fathers. Well, and every father thought of doing exactly that. Right. Every single one. And what he said to the law enforcement people yes. around him. What would you do? Said, what would you do? Yes. I thought that was very powerful. Yeah. And I, th I think it was also very powerful. And one of the things you did so brilliantly in the film is to show the ripple effects. This one man who did these terrible things affected the women he abused. It affected their parents. One of them committed suicide. It affected, I mean, we, one wrong thing causes so much harm. Yeah, we, you know, you can't fit everything into a, a documentary. Uh, so we struggled, you know, with our uh, director and, and producers and everything. Uh, but that scene is, is very powerful. What we left out, which I'm sad about and I fought for, was the law enforcement guys brought him down and they, you know, said, okay, relax, relax. Then he got up and said, what would you do? As he's leaving and being escorted out by five big law enforcement guys, what you didn't see was he turned around and he said, do you guys have daughters? Mm. By the way, he was the father of three mm -hmm. victims. Oh, wow. Three victims. Wow. So, yeah, it, we all, you know, we just all felt that pain. I think, too, as, I mean, as a society, we are 50-50 with our genders. And showing up is a big deal before it may be relevant to your life. But opening that conversation, even just by being there or even just by um, supporting your local resources, I think, I think are very important. And um, setting an early precedent in the stance that you will take in sexual abuse and any kind of abuse in general. Well, and, and let's say you're a, a CEO of your organization. Let's just put that in the thought. If you are not showing your entire staff below you what your feelings are on sexual assault and sexual harassment, it has to start from the top and trickle down. They need to know where you stand and enforce that. Hold people accountable. It is not acceptable in this place that I work. And if you are part of a place that does not believe it is in your workplace or in your society or in your community, you are the problem. And I mean that with kindness because you have to recognize that it is in your community and how to help make it better for the children to come. Uh, over here. Thank you again. Oh, hello. Okay. Thank you again, everybody. Um, so I just wanted to, I mean, you mentioned that many organizations that work in this work are historically underfunded. You know, I've worked with plenty of them, obviously, Trinae, you and I work together in some capacities. Uh, they work on pennies. <laughs> um, and so thinking about the stats, one in six women deal with sexual assault, one in 33 men. Um, that is more than breast cancer for women. That's one in eight breast cancer. So, how, so as a society, what we fund uh, really talks about our priorities. So how do we start to change that to make sure that sexual assault is at the top of our priority list since it impacts such, so many people? Well, I think, you know, searching out who you're, who's in your community, similar to the question before, really finding out what is, you know, the CACs, the, the child advocacy centers that are in your community, the organizations that are doing the work. Because the organization that I found, the one that I'm working for, I accidentally Googled because I didn't understand who to go to. And I'm in this national major platform. You'd think we were given resources. Here, go to this person. Talk to these people. Mm -hmm. No, we were given no one. So I had to search out who was doing that work in my community and come to find out they'd been doing it for 13 years, well before our case. And those kind of organizations exist. So give to those organizations. Find out what they need. Do they need transportation for their survivors? Do they need money for clothing kits, for the rape kits? Do they need money for... Um, you know, a new program that they're trying to do yoga maybe, or meditation, or gardening. I mean, there's so many different ways to help your, your community mm -hmm. and the organizations that are doing the work. You just have to figure out who they are and where they are and really learn about them and learn who's doing the work because we do work off nothing. I mean, it is, it is very minimal. And the best thing about it is that it can be um, out of positivity 
and not always out of trauma. You can be proactive and love your community and want to support those around you um, as being excited about a change and not devastated about the past. You know, as anyone who's undergone abuse, you want to be forward thinking in prevention, and a lot of that is um, seeking out those opportunities um, to help and support those around you. But it is, I mean, you raise a good point, because it is long before the, even this, it's been a problem in terms of where charitable fundraising goes. You get, you get the $100 million, $500 million grants to hospitals and to, and to universities, typically. You get your name on a building, huge grants. Child abuse, it's not that sexy. You know, for, for donors, they don't give the big money. Yeah. I just want to make a quick point. Uh, and th this is a sad commentary on uh, somebody asked about the institutional uh, dysfunction. The Olympic Committee, after the Nasser trial, you know, was getting hammered and hammered by the media and, and really, you know, uh, getting sort of, uh, uh, sort of, well, they were shut down. But one of the things that really got their attention was the major corporate sponsors, the uh, Procter & Gamble, mm -hmm. the Under Armour, the Nikes, the Hershey Corporation. These are $100 million Olympic sponsors and then there's a separate group of sponsors that just do USA Gymnastics. They started pulling their funding. P&G uh, was the first one. And uh, when, when the Olympic Committee heard that, there were some real shock waves going on. And you know, that's, that's kind of sad that they don't pay attention to hearing so, these yeah. voices. So they're what they're they hear is, is the money and the, mm -hmm. the cash flow. I will tell you one other thing. There are some companies that are now talking about, we're getting some rumors through the pipeline, about starting advocacy programs. Uh, and some of them have been involved with the Olympics before. So I think there's, a, there's some opportunity there. I, I have a question about that, which is th this money is so crucial. I mean, these Olympic committees wouldn't exist without the, these big sponsors. Did the sponsors ever come forward and say, hey, guys, you obviously need to do something from, from the ground up. There needs to be change, there needs to be new rules, there needs to be something so that this is nipped in the bud early on and not, what was it, 20 years later or however long that he, he did this for. Do sponsors ever get in and say, I'm, I'm giving you money, I'm putting my name on this, you need to fix this? Great question. Procter & Gamble, uh, we were at the press conference with uh, uh, John Manley when Rachel was there. And uh, Manley looked right in the camera uh, at the, it was the national championship, and said, okay, Procter & Gamble, you're sponsoring this event, and you're being, do you really want blood on your hands? Do you want to be part of enabling sexual predators? The very next day, the president of P&G called the president of the Olympic Committee and said, we're gone, we're out of here. So, you know, that's one thing. Um, yeah, I think that um, we're, we're going to see uh, some more of that, and I think... Um, I'm, I'm hopeful that, that there's, there's going to be uh, some, some changes made. Yeah. Let's see, the gentleman in the front here. Um, so first of all, thank you for your courage in coming forward. And guys, uh, amazing film, really. Um, uh, I'm Tom Ferry. I'm the executive director of the Aspen Institute Sports Society program. And we're entirely focused on solutions, you know, shared solutions in sports. My great fear with this whole scandal is that we're not going to actually uh, drive the systems level changes that are going to, going to make the difference, right? So we've outed a few bad people, we, um, but we still have in place a system where not just sexual abuse, but throughout youth sports, there is tons of physical abuse, there is emotional abuse. The Center for Safe Sport has gotten plenty of, um, you know, uh, information about this. They don't even know what, how to begin to deal with these other elements of it. Now, in 1978, Congress put the U.S. Olympic Committee in charge of coordinating amateur sports activity in this country. Um, and part of that went all the way down to the grassroots. Um, increasingly, over time, it became a focus on medals and, and money. Um, got away with, you know, got really John, the George Steinbrenner and the commission in the 1990s really shifted the ethos and when Scott Blackman and others came in with the incentives for winning in the Olympics and otherwise it ramped up even further. So it actually doesn't surprise me that we ended up in this situation because all of the incentives were about ignoring uh, abuse at the youth sport level. 
So my question for you is, can we actually um, deal with this problem and prevent a whole another generation of kids being abused in all different forms if we don't ask the Olympic Committee to change, and it starts with Congress, change what it is all about, meaning the grassroots. Does it require a, a mandate from top down that you, it, it, it's not about the gym, it's not about winning medals in the gym. It, you know, I, I wrote a piece in the New York Times, I'm sorry, we'll get to the question. I wrote a piece in the New York Times about a month ago about Norway and their system. They've got something called the children's rights in sport, okay? And as part of that, it's, they've decided not to fund their version of USA Gymnastics, except at the grassroots, because the behavior that it takes to become a winning Olympic level gymnast, gymnast is not consistent with what they want out of children. So, I'm sorry. Yeah, actually, David, let me, you, you were talking about the, about the not waiving the $300,000 for the four minutes, which you would think they would do as sort of a, a gesture of, hey, we want to help you make this film because this film will change things. When you talk to people on, on, at, the, at the Olympic Committee at the high levels, do you feel like they're saying, oh, there were some bad guys and we got rid of them? Or are they saying, we need some kind of systemic change so this doesn't happen again? Which, which, which well, I think, I think you, hear, you hear, and you're absolutely right, by the way. The mission of the US Olympic Committee is, is to raise money and, and, and to, to, to win medals. It's not to protect the athletes. But you know, I, I, when, when you do talk to the Olympic Committee, it's yes, we, we've gotten rid of the bad guys. And yes, we need to affect change. But then the next sentence is, this is a big distraction. Let's get back to winning medals. That, that, and, that, and you listen to that, and you, get, that you still didn't get it. You still, the message didn't go through that it can't all be about winning medals. So I'm a little bit concerned. I mean, I mean we're doing a lot of things. We safe sport, but safe sport's woefully underfunded. You know, there's got zillions of cases that are backlogged. We have numerous examples of, of cases that you know, haven't gone through properly. Um, there is a commission that we're underwriting at the University of Pennsylvania that's being uh, conducted by <coughs> academics around the world that's going to be doing a comprehensive report on the Larry Nassar scandal. Stephen and I are involved with that, and so that's going to be, I think, excellent. And we've got all these programs, but I think it, it's, 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 it's going to be an ongoing battle. Is my um, Tom, th thank you for your question, and um, this guy's been around forever, and I've, I've followed your work, and, and I haven't seen you in a long time, but thank you very much for, for your your overview. Yeah, it's a tough question. Um, I went to the, to the International Olympic Committee, which is the governing body for 205 members, nations, of the Olympic family. And because I have friends at the Medical Commission, Ethics Commission, and Women's uh, Commission, and I basically uh, wouldn't say filed a grievance. I wrote a nasty letter. I called them because we're friends. And then I wrote a letter and I said, are you aware of how bad things are? And they said, yeah, but you know, Stephen, it's bad. We've had the situation in UK with the uh, abuse of the soccer players. And we had this thing in Norway. We had the skaters. And they were basically saying, it comes with the territory. It just comes hmm. with the territory. And I went to Abuse comes with the territory? Yeah, yeah. That's the word that I was getting. And I, I really, really got upset. So I went to President Bach, who's the president of the the big daddy, who's somebody David and I know very well and have worked with, and I have a lot of respect for him. Uh, and I said, Dr. Bach, we, we really need to do something about this. And he said, look, uh, I, I've been following it carefully, and I do read the New York Times, and I do read ESPN, and I do read um, the, the stories, and I've been seeing you know, the work you're doing. Um, I'm not going to take this particular case on. Uh, because it really is incumbent on the NOC, the national uh, governing body, and the United States to, to oversee it. But I will tell you this. I will personally set up a victim's compensation fund for the athletes who suffered. This is the president of the IOC. And I, I, was, I was deeply moved by that. Uh, he didn't have to do that, but he said this is, this is horrendous. This is probably the worst moment in the history of, of sport. Um, the downside to that is I think there need to be, as part of we look, as we look at infrastructure, we look at change, and we look at the, uh, the, the politics of how to bring in a new generation, I think we need uh, bigger sanctions from the International Olympic Committee who will say, you're out of here. You are not invited to Tokyo. 
You are not invited to world competitions. You need to clean your house and make sure your children and your athletes are safe. Otherwise, you're not part of our family. Yeah, that's an excellent, on that note, which is, I think is, is an excellent uh, summary of what needs to be done. Certainly sounds like it. Um, thank you all so much. I'm sorry we didn't get to all your questions. <laughs>